We're good to go? All right, thanks, and welcome. Thanks for everyone coming for the colloquium. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce um, someone I've known for a little while, Dr. Thomas Allison. He's a professor at uh, Stony Brook University, and he'll be our colloquium speaker today. Uh, Tom got his PhD at the University of California at Berkeley back in 2010, molecular dynamics at the time. And then he moved on to do a postdoc at Jilla, University of Colorado. Uh, same group I had been at, actually the Junies group, and worked on uh, a lot of things, well, among them intracavity, high harmonic generation with frequency cones. And then since 2013, I believe, he's been in a linear superposition of the physics and chemistry department in the faculty uh, at Stony Brook. Um, and so Tom's, Tom's a very broad uh, variety of interests, um, and uh, generally speaking, it applies to using frequency combs and other novel sources for ultrafast and nonlinear spectroscopy. Um, I really admire some of the experiments. Uh, he's put in a lot of time both in developing novel sources, such as high harmonics with frequency combs, but then going on to utilize those sources for really nice experiments in, in a variety of fields. And today he's going to tell us about time-resolved dynamics of uh, excitons and electron dynamics. Technically, ultrafast imaging of electron exon dynamics and heating materials. So it's a pleasure to have you here today, Tom. Turn it over to you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thanks for the uh, uh, everybody today. Meeting with me has been uh, really fantastic, and I've just had a, a great day. And um, I'm really excited to show you some of these results, which we've gotten recently. I'm going to stand over here so I can point to this thing with, with my right hand more naturally. Um, so. Uh, today I'm going to tell you about our efforts in really imaging, uh, you know, sort of as close as the laws of physics will let you get to sort of imaging wave functions in, in 2D materials. Um, and uh, before I do that, I just wanted to give a little background about my group and some of the things we do. As uh, Jason mentioned, we work with frequency combs. And for those of you who don't know what a frequency comb is, a frequency comb is basically a mode lock laser. I put an asterisk here because it doesn't have to be a laser could be various other devices, but something that puts out pulses with very well-defined timing and phase. And so the idea is that phase evolution is deterministic, such that if you knew the phase of this pulse, you knew the phase. If you knew the electric field of this pulse, you know the electric field of this pulse, and a pulse even a million pulses later. And then just very simple for a transform in the frequency domain, that gives you a comb of evenly spaced lines. Um, and, and the beautiful thing is that this comb of evenly spaced lines uh, is related to, the fr these optical frequencies are related to these two electronically countable radio frequencies by just a simple equation where n is an integer. So if you can measure these uh, two uh, radio frequencies and reference them, say, to an atomic clock, then you know all of these optical frequencies. Some, pe some people sometimes say it's like having a million frequency stabilized lasers at once because you can think of each of these lines as a CW laser. From a practical point of view, you can think of it as kind of like uh, a reducing gear where you basically can take radio frequencies and make precise optical frequencies or vice versa. Or you can think of it, if you like, as sort of a synthesizer for light waves. And so the frequency comb, you know, has been awarded the Nobel Prize in physics in 2005 and has rendered rev revolutions of what you can do in precision metrology, atomic clocks, etc. Um, and that's what it was originally designed for. You know, the original intention was, you say, you take your frequency comb and, you know, you want to reference a CW laser. Uh, so you take your frequency comb and then take a CW laser, measure its frequency very precisely with the frequency comb and do things like high, res high resolution spectroscopy, precision metrology, atomic clocks, etc. That's what it was invented for. Right? And so what I do, I'm somewhat maybe apocryphal in this business, I take this beautiful, precise thing that, you know, can measure, you know, you can use to measure the frequency of some transition to a part in 10 to the 17. I take that and I apply it to the dirty, messy, blobbish, from a spectroscopy point of view, business of ultrafast spectroscopy. And when I set up my lab, I basically started two sort of projects, two general themes of projects. One was to develop, use this technology to impact time-resolved photoelectron spectroscopy at surfaces and sort of watching electrons and holes move at, at surfaces. And uh, the other one was to do uh, dynamics of, of gas phase clusters. And this was a gas phase experiment. So then, you know, since then, it's just sort of mushroomed into 
looking at all these different things, and we have a ton of, uh, of stuff going on. Uh, mostly, I'm going to be telling you today about this 2D materials uh, work we've done recently, but I just wanted to, you know, tell you a little bit about some of the other projects. And, and you might ask, like, why? Like, what is the win? What, you know, why, why would you use a frequency comb for ultrafast spectroscopy? Ultrafast spectroscopy, you're usually looking at something where your coherence time is, you know, 10 femtoseconds or 100 femtoseconds, right? So what is this molecule or material that I excite care that this pulse that's coming 10 nanoseconds later, what does it care about the phase? It's lost all memory of the phase of the first pulse you put. Why would it matter? Well, it doesn't matter. The material doesn't care, but well, the molecule doesn't care, but you can build experiments around it where the apparatus cares and makes use of that. And so we do a lot of using a trick, actually pioneered by Jason Jones in the early part of this century, uh, but basically invented by Jason, uh, to, uh, sorry if that dates you, but, but anyway, uh, basically that Jason invented this trick of, uh, of basically taking a frequency comb and passively amplifying it in an optical resonator. So the idea in the time domain, you can think about it as you have a, uh, uh, a train of pulses, you have one in the cavity, and you bring a fresh pulse at just the right time, at just the right phase, to constructively interfere with that pulse circulating in the cavity, and then you can build up a large power uh, for the pulse in the cavity. Or you can think in the frequency domain, it's actually even simpler. Just basically, your, your cavity right, has resonances. Every time you fit another wavelength in between the mirrors, you get a resonance. right? And you're lining up a large number, say 10 to the 4 or 10 to the 5, comb teeth with those cavity resonances all at the same time by controlling those, um, those, those electronically countable frequencies I talked about before. And so this can be a big win. Uh, from a power point of view, you can build up tens of kilowatts or even more power in these cavities. Or actually, as I, I'll show you in the next slide, you can also, if you can put your experiment in a cavity, you can get large signal enhancements, uh, basically due to the Q or the finesse of the cavity. And so this is an example doing ultra-fast spectroscopy. We pioneered this doing, you know, basically cavity enhancing ultra-fast nonlinear spectroscopy signals where we're basically putting molecules in a cavity. Actually, in this case, we did it with two cavities. Um, one for the pump, one for the probe, and doing, you know, just transient absorption, ultra-fast optical spectroscopy, but now on orders and orders and orders and orders of magnitude, less stuff. So we're measuring, you know, bog standard pump probe spectroscopy, pump a sample, right, and then look at how the light of a probe pulse is absorbed, but we're measuring absorbance down to 10 to the minus 10, right? So now we can do ultra-dilute samples in terms of concentrations you can think about we can do this, let's say you had molecules on a surface, we can go down to like 10 to the minus 5 of a monolayer. So column densities of sort of 10 to the 10 molecules per centimeter squared. So this was, this was pretty cool. We did the demonstration. And uh, if you're familiar with the comb world, many things are demonstrations. And I, I like to think of it in some sense as like what happens with frequency comps is um, like I'm a bass. Actually, I like to sing. You can probably tell I'm a bass. So I like to sing. I sing in a choir, right? But above middle C, for me, it gets, like, pretty dicey. Like, you don't want to hear it, right? And, and so, you know, we all have a comfort zone where we live, right, where we, can, where we can sing well, right? But then you want to get out of that comfort zone. And so this is where combs are is basically, or, well, it's, it's getting better all the time. But, you know, traditionally, we're very good at making frequency combs in this sort of 1 micron or 1.5 micron or maybe 800 nanometers tie staff, right? But then to get out of this zone requires significant work. So a lot of the work in my lab has actually been trying to go, especially in the last couple of years, has been going from these demonstration experiments to using this, these frequency comb tricks, these frequency comb techniques to do real spectroscopy. Um, and uh, it, it sounds better than me singing above middle C, but it's still taking uh, significant work to get there. So here's just an example of taking that experiment I showed you before and now making it tunable this is, you know, we have a 10-watt frequency comb, then we have a stabilized optical parametric oscillator, then we couple that tunable light to the cavity, and we're basically now doing this cavity enhancement trick, which Jason pioneered. We're doing it over the whole visible spectrum with one set of cavity mirrors. Um, and then we're doing, you know, real transient absorption, not just transient absorption, but transient absorption spectroscopy now, right? And then we can compare this to solution phase measurements. And, you know, this sort of gets more into hardcore gas phase chemical physics now, but um, the theorists love us, right, because now we can do these measurements in an environment where they can really do 
nice calculations. Okay, and I could talk, I can give a whole talk about this, but uh, what I came to talk to you about today is actually a different project where we're using this frequency comp stuff now to do, to study uh, excitons in 2D materials. So this sort of outline for my talk is I'm going to give an overview of why we might be interested in these things and the dynamics we want to look at. Then what I'm going to try and convey in the middle here is that the way we can actually image these wave functions, if you will, is really an optics problem. And, and in many ways, and, and a lot of the concepts you learn in optics basically transfer over to doing this type of imaging, even though our ultimate imaging is with electrons, it's still the optics of the electron microscope is how we're imaging it. And then there's a lot of laser optics to get there, of course. And then I'll talk about some results uh, that we have sort of hot off the press of looking at exciton dynamics in, in uh, monolayer tungsten disulfide. Okay, so 2D materials. So what's all the big deal about the 2D materials? Uh, basically, it's, it's, it's exciting for a number of reasons. One reason is because 2D materials can have band structures uh, that you just don't see in regular materials. So, for example, graphene is the poster child for that, where you are, it's hard to see in regular materials, where you basically have, uh, due to the symmetry of the problem, you end up with these uh, so-called rack cones or, you know, dispersion relation here where the electron energy depends linearly on K, the momentum, as opposed to K squared. And so this has, you know, led to enormous uh, studies on graphene. But then what maybe gets really exciting now is not just you can make the 2D material, but now the way you make these things, especially by exfoliation, scotch tape peeling, you can basically stack them and make heterostructures. And those heterostructures can have unique properties that are not like any of the constituents. So here's an example of, um, from Lee Bai Huang's group, looking at basically transport in um, bilayers of tungsten disulfide and tungsten diselenide. And you know, this is the transport in one layer individually, right? And you can see it's just much, much faster. Um, this is looking at how a spot, you know, if you create, create some excitons, how does that grow? Kind of like if I were to open a bottle of perfume here, how fast does it diffuse out? Right? And you can see it's much, much faster uh, in these, in these bilayers, and it also depends on the twist angle, because when you twist these two things, uh, you can have a, a moray potential. So you have this enormous uh, playground in these materials, and another really, you know, nice, attractive thing of them is that because of the 2D nature of the material, you have less dielectric screening between electrons and holes, you can have excitons in these materials, bound electron-hole pairs, with very strong binding energy. Normally you think excitons, okay, this is like low temperature semiconductor physics, I've got to get to, you know, 10 Kelvin in some gallium arsenide quantum well or something, right? This, these things are bound by half an EV sometimes, or almost half an EV, right? So these are totally bound at room temperature and in principle can be optically addressable, nice quantum states to do things with. Um, and they also have these very interesting... Uh, because you break the symmetry, now you've got two atoms as opposed to graphene where you just had all carbon atoms. Now you've got two types of atoms. Because you break the symmetry, you have the so-called chiral selection rules where you actually have um, inequivalent, if you look at the brilliant zone, I guess I should have put a picture up of the brilliant zone, but you have inequivalent points in the brilliant zone where basically you can excite one place in the brilliant zone with light polarized one way, circularly polarized one way, and another place in the brilliant zone with light circularly polarized the other way. So you have this so-called so valley selective excitation. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about that a bunch in this. Um, so this, you know, you have sort of uh, very strongly bound uh, optically addressable states in these materials, which people talk about doing all kinds of things. You probably hear these buzzwords like valleytronics and so forth. But if you take away, you know, one thing from this talk, I guess it would be the following, uh, is that, you know, a strong Coulomb interaction give if it gives you these excitons, you know, bound by, in this case, 350 milliEV below the band gap. But the strong Coulomb interaction between the electron hole also taketh away. And that what it means is when you try and excite an exciton here, let's say in one place in the brilliant zone called K+, plus, right, that that exciton can now be coupled through its interaction with states in other parts of the brilliant zone. So things get better because now you've got these strongly bound, you know, quote unquote, stable states, but then they also, you have stronger coupling to other, other states. Okay, and so, you know, how do you write this down? 
you would think about, okay, let's search this to have an exciton with an electron or a hole here in the valence band and an electron in the conduction band. I could write the way, the first thing I would try and do is write the wave function as, you know, basically a product state of a, of a, of a hole and a, and a conduction band electron hole with a valence band conduction band electron. They could each have their own momenta and then I could have a total center of mass momentum of this thing, which is the difference between these two. Um, and, you know, I could label that like that. And that's what you would like is that basically you could just think of it like that. But then what happens is because of these coupling, really basically what you need to do is think about your total eigenstate, your wave function, as being a superposition of these eigenstates all around the brillion zone. Okay, of not eigenstates of these, of these exciton states all throughout the brillion zone. And what that means is that if you optically address one of them here, let's say you're not exciting an eigenstate, right? you're exciting a bright state, that bright state, I have to make it out of a superposition of eigenstates with different energies, and that fundamentally then gives you dynamics, right? So you're trying to address, say, a particular valley, and now what happens is you're launching dynamics where it's coupling, washing around all the other states, okay? Um, you can, you know, basically when you set this problem up, you, you know, set up a basis, you set up a Hamiltonian, you try and find the eigenstates in that basis, and you know, the dominant thing that you have is this so-called exchange interaction between the excitons. I'm not going to get too much into all the math of this. You have experts here on it that know much more about it than, than I do. So that's good, but I just want to put a couple of take-home points is that this dominant exchange interaction between, at least this, this is what's widely implicated as being the dominant thing that mixes these exciton states. This dominant interaction does as a couple of selection rules. So one thing is it couples the bright excitons to other bright excitons, okay? So one way to think about this problem actually is you can think about it as you excite an exciton and you can think of that as having a, you know, sort of an oscillating dipole and then radiatively coupling to other exciton states throughout the brillion zone, okay? Another thing about it is that it conserves this exciton momentum. So this exciton momentum that I talked about, this difference between the electron and hole uh, uh, momenta is still a good quantum number. And the final thing is that it's going to most, you know, being sort of a mixing of the wave function, it's going to most strongly couple states that are nearly degenerate, okay, that have the, the energy difference between them that is small, like everything else, right? Okay, so that's, you know, the, 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 the theory, and people do, you know, serious calculations on this at various levels of theory, and then come up with basically splittings due to these interactions between the exciton states. And those are order, you know, tens of milli EV. So though from that, you'd expect dynamics on sort of the 100, you know, 50 to 100 femtosecond time scale that comes about this. So you try and, you know, excite to one valley and you sort of quickly coupled and you get a quantum beat between the, the different uh, valley states. And so you can think about it, you know, is that this upper band here, for example, is uh, a superposition of, excitons in one valley versus and excitons in the other valley with a minus sign here and then this lower band is a superposition of excitons uh, with the plus sign, right? So you get a sort of classic, you know, two-level splitting. Um, and another key thing I want you to remember for later in the talk is that this exchange interaction is supposed to scale as the electron hole wave function overlap times the center of mass momentum. Okay, so that's kind of, you know, one paradigm of this. And then people do ultra-fast spectroscopy experiments, uh, optical pump, optical probe. There are many such experiments. I'm only showing two here. Uh, but one thing that they all have in common that they often see is that you excite in one valley and actually almost instantaneously you're seeing a signal in the other valley. So the question is, is this due to this intervalley Coulomb exchange coupling or... Is it maybe due to phonons or something else? Is it actually the electron moving? Or is it just now that I, when I excite the wave function in this valley, now basically when I excite the exciton in this valley, it's basically modifying you know, or shifting the, the resonance in the other valley, right? such that I would see an optical change when I excite with the other polarization in the other valley, even if I haven't actually transferred the electron or the hole over there. So what is actually happening you know, then people get into modeling in these experiments and they tell hey, all kinds of stories about what might be going on, sometimes very complicated mechanisms where, okay, first I'm scattering a phonon, then I'm doing intervalley Coulomb exchange, 
They also talk about so-called sort of Dexter-like coupling, where instead of, you know, this uh, exciton here uh, coupling to the degenerate uh, B exciton in the other valley, you actually have a, a coupling between the B and the A excitons in a different valley. So there could be all kinds of different stuff going on. Um, I guess the main point I want to make here now is that all these pictures people draw, okay, they're all in momentum space, right? They're all thinking about what is happening coupling between these states and, and this, you know, electron or hole momentum to these states and this electron or hole momentum, right? When you do an optical measurement like this, you're integrating over the whole momentum space to get this optical measurement, right? So the question now is can we just measure it in momentum space in the basis that these guys do the calculation in, right? And not only just do the calculation in, if you were to go to the board and just draw a cartoon of what's going on, you would draw it in momentum space. So can we actually measure it that way? Okay, so the way we go about that is we try and do what's called ARPES. So ARPES is in principle a very simple experiment. You shine a photon with its photon energy above the work function of the material, and electrons come out. You measure their electrons. You'll measure the electron. But there's a gift from nature. This gift is actually, it's actually the same thing as Snell's law. So you remember in your Snell's law, when you did optics, right, you think about, you get, why do you have Snell's law as you're lining up the wave fronts on the surface? You conserve the parallel component of the momentum of the wave function of the electron on the surface. So when the electron's coming out, uh, you conserve this parallel momentum. And of course, you have energy conservation between those. So with all of that, you basically get energy versus the momentum. You get the bands. You're seeing the bands. This is experimental data from monolayer tungsten disulfide taken out of synchrotron. And you see beautifully here the bands. You can do it on molecules, too. You don't just have to do it on, uh, you know, these monolayer or even bulk crystals, right? Anything that has any kind of periodic order where you can get your atoms in some periodic arrangement, you can do these, these measurements. And... Um, so it's really great. It's really powerful. All this data I'm showing you now is taken at synchrotrons. So for time-resolved stuff, synchrotrons, the pulses are too long. They're 100 picosecond pulses. Way too slow to see any of this stuff. So can we do it ultra-fast? Can we do the pump probe experiment? So yes, in principle, but there's a number of things that make that somewhat difficult. One is that, yes, Snell's law is great. Here I'm showing the wave fronts lining up. You've got K parallel in the bulk equals K parallel in the back room, in the vacuum, that's great. But it also means, you know, you also now you have electrons, right? I mean, if you want to have a certain K, right? So this goes out to, you know, 1.5 inverse, inverse angstrom or so. If I want to have that kind of momentum for my electron, I have to give it a certain amount of energy. And that energy you want to give it ends up being you need sort of 10, 20 EV of kinetic energy to get all your electrons that you want to see out of the solid. If you don't have that, um, then they just basically stay in. Another, and so you need sort of extreme ultraviolet light to do this. That's why most people do it at a synchrotron, right? And so from an optics point of view, that's a big frowny face because that's like the worst place in the electromagnetic spectrum to do optics. It's also where I've done most of my career. So it's, it's, it's mat, I'm a masochist or something, but in any event. Um, so, you know, this is just illustrating that if you did this with your 6 EV light, you'd only get a small fraction of the brilliant zone. If you want to get the full brilliant zone, you'd have extreme EV light. So, hey, but what's the big deal? You know, you just go call up uh, femtosecond laser R us, get yourself femtosecond laser, shine it in a gas, make harmonics. You've probably heard about high harmonic generation. You can easily make, you know, tens, 100 EV photons with the garden variety femtosecond laser and some vacuum plumbing, right? So what's, what's the big deal, right? Well, the issue is that, you know, yeah, you can do that, and it's fine, and people did do that, actually in the 90s, basically, not long after, uh, uh, you know, femtosecond lasers and, and, uh, and uh, um, uh, high harmonic generation, or high power femtosecond lasers and high harmonic generation were discovered. They did this, but... There's, there's a problem, and that is, you know, you've got to think about what you're trying to do here. So when you, the data I showed you before, you're basically, one, you're taking one image, okay? So you can do pump probe now. You've got to take more images. You've got to take a bunch of images, right? You've got to take frames. So you need more data because of that. If it were just that, 
That wouldn't be that bad. It's much, 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 much worse than that. If you take a solid or molecules and, you know, yeah, go ahead. But then when you go to the PQV, don't you disturb that uh, Snell's law? Don't you add the photon momentum to the photon electron momentum? The, the K perpendicular to the surface is not conserved. So only K parallel is conserved. So K perpendicular is not conserved. So K perpendicular, uh, yeah, it gets a big boost. Absolutely. Or another way to think of it is, if you want to think of it as XUV is basically high, exciting to a very high lying band in the solid, and then it comes out. So, um, so, so, um, uh, so, you know, one thing is you need to record frames, right? So you want to take this and, and record a bunch of frames. So this is one image. I want to take many of these. But that's not the biggest problem. The biggest problem, right, is that this measurement here, for example, is talking to all the electrons, right? If you take your sample and you excite all the electrons, that's called ablation, right? You're going you're gonna to blow it up, right? If you take your sample and you excite 10% of the electrons, that's called maybe not ablation, but it's certainly some kind of exotic phase you're creating, right? Like an electron hole plasma or something. 1%, you're still probably getting the wrong answer, right? Because you're exciting all these carriers and the, you're going to be dominantly seeing the electrons talking to your excitons talking to each other rather than the intrinsic dynamics you want to see. So you need to excite the sample way, way low. Orders of magnitude down from that ground state measurement I showed you before. So ta imagine taking a peak like this and now going four orders of magnitude down. That's what you have to do. So when you try and do this with lasers, this is the big problem you run into. And as a result, most of the work people have done with lasers has been in the strongly excited regime, where they're basically pumping strongly and that's sort of changing the bands, right? What I want to do is look at exciting and looking at the intrinsic dynamics of these carriers in the material as it would be in a device, right? And so to give you an idea of what type of numbers we're talking about, here's an example from tungsten disulfide. This is our data. This is basically looking at a pump probe trace versus these different colors or different excitation fluences. So we're looking here at you know, at 5 microjoules per centimeter squared is sort of the same as 1.3. All of a sudden, I'm at 10, and now you see the dynamics are different because now you basically have excitons bouncing off each other as opposed to seeing just the dynamics of the material. So this is an extremely, well, it, this is orders of magnitude lower than people have been able to do before, really. Okay, so how do we address this problem? Well, what can you do? So the signal you're going to get is basically proportional to how many times per second you do the experiment, how well you collect the electrons, right? You shine a UV light on a surface, electrons come out, you've got to collect them somehow, times how hard you pump. That I just showed you is limited by the sample physics. If you want to get it right, you don't want to pump too hard. And then there's another challenge here, right? And that, you know, a nice thing about doing optics with photons is that they don't really talk to each other much, right? And optics, you know, you, you don't, you basically they don't repel each other. But optics with electrons, they're charged, and they don't like to all get focused down, for example. And so the space charge uh, repulsion of the electrons basically limits to how many electrons per pulse you can make in the experiment to a pitifully small number. So with this, on these two, you're sort of screwed. And on these two, this is where you can try and win. So in the last couple of years, both in my lab and in others, this is where we make a lot of progress. What we've done now is we've taken this High harmonic generation, which you, do, you know your garden variety laser might run at a kilohertz or 10 kilohertz now. Right now we're doing it at 100 megahertz, or what I'll show you is 60 megahertz, right? And you can do that two ways. You can either go after that with big laser, uh, or you can, you know just basically brute force approach, just build kilowatt scale femtosecond lasers, or you can do it with this cavity enhancement trick that I introduced before. And then the next revolution that's happening is basically doing the electron optics in a clever way to take you from the normal hemisphere analyzer you'd see at a synchrotron where you're recording a small slice here of, um, of uh, you know, the total KX, KY energy distribution you want to get to getting it all in parallel. So let me tell you a little bit first about the landscape of what's happening in this field just in the last couple of years. So I, I sort of divided it. Maybe, I, you know, I just this is my own uh, delusions of grandeur or something. But basically there's two ways you could go about making the harmonics. One I call the Death Star approach where you just get yourself a big laser 
and there's lots of people doing that, and then we use the force. And I guess that, you know, if I'm Skywalker here, then I guess that would make Jason Obi-Wan, who taught us how to do this, right? He was the pioneer here. Uh, but basically we, and uh, there's another group also that's doing that, and then, you know, on this Punnett Square, there's also tons of people getting into this momentum microscope game. Uh, and I have to admit that I am also sort of tempted by the dark side, and I build, a, I collaborate with Ohio State to build a user facility, which will uh, take the Death Star approach as well. Um, and so here's what we do, is we do high harmonic generation in a cavity. Uh, this was, you know, the first sort of pioneering experiments were done uh, by Jason Jones and when he was at Jilla, and also uh, the group in Garking. And the idea is you take your comb, you resonantly enhance it in a cavity, you sort of getting 10 kilowatts circulating in the cavity, then you focus in a gas jet, have to have some way to get the harmonics out. Uh, you know, it didn't grab a whole lot of attention outside of the metrology world in the beginning because the power was extremely low. And then both through work at Jilla and also here at University of Arizona, uh, and then later a few other places too, we sort of improved the power to, you know, sort of greater than 100 microwatts. You'll see even claims now milliwatt per harmonic. Uh, in terms of the, the flux, you know, this is basically one-tenth of the spectral brightness. is basically one-tenth of an undulator at the advanced light source synchrotron dedicated to doing this type of science. So it's, it starts to become something now. Uh, and then when I, you know, moved to Stony Brook, one of my goals was to take this technology then and, and apply it to, to doing stuff with, right? And so now this puts you, since the optics cloaking, I thought I'd give a few technical details. It all looks nice, but this puts you in sort of a place where you don't have too many uh, uh, too many Jedi with you, I guess. In that, you know, most people who do femtosecond lasers might care about one of these three things: phase coherence, short pulse. Maybe they might care about two. It's rare that people care about all three. And when you do this, you know, we're actually looking at cavities with sort of 100 kilohertz line widths, and we want short pulses to make the harmonics. And it turns out with some of the details that we worked out and also that Jason worked out, you want to start with kind of a big laser, uh, sort of a hun maybe one arm of a Death Star, right? So you just want to start with sort of 100-watt-ish lasers. So, you know, most people that do 100-watt femtosecond lasers are doing machining or something, and you couldn't care less if it's 500 femtoseconds or 100 femtoseconds. And they really couldn't care if it's, phase, if it's a column or not, right? So, so you get into this world where you have to build it yourself, so we do that. You know, this is an 80-watt comb that we built at Stony Brook using uh, rod amplifiers uh, and, and so forth. So we did all of that, and it works. So this is uh, sort of our breakthrough paper where we showed, you know, just the light source, basically. And, you know, you think about all the things you'd have at a synchrotron, the photon energy range, the flux, the stability is another big one, and then the spot size at the sample is basically all the same as that a synchrotron. And the key thing is the repetition right now. We're doing this at 60 megahertz, right? And they, they, that's the data rate, right? And so, but the only difference is now, instead of, you know, picosecond or 100 picosecond pulses at a synchrotron, now we're 100 femtosecond pulses. Um, and so this is really exciting compared to what you could do before. This just shows you sort of, you know, thinking about the space charge limits. This was sort of pre-microscope. The attainable sample currents you could get you know, synchrotrons kind of live here, and the resolution, and this is us, and this was, you know, the UBC group. Now you could fill this plot in with many Death Stars as well, getting in this game, and, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of off to the races. So the other breakthrough I mentioned was this momentum microscopy. So this was, you know, sort of optics to the rescue, right? Let's not, let's not build a big laser here. Let's just use coherence, right? Let's use interference, basic optics principles to enhance our, our signal. Right. This solution to the uh, electron detection problem is also remarkably simple optics. Right. What do we teach um, our students? Right. When you want to, what what does a lens do? Right. A lens doesn't change the right at the lens. It doesn't change the position of any rays. It just changes the angle. So if I want to image something in momentum space, what I do is I just image. Basically, I put a lens to collect the rays. Right? And then I just image with other optics downstream. I image the plane of that lens. Or I image the back focal plane of that lens. Right? And that's what you do. So this is an electron microscope now. 
invented by these guys to do this also with time of flight. So they basically have an electron microscope column, and then you, you suck all the electrons. Uh, you set up this objective here so that you get an achromatic momentum image at a certain plane in the microscope, and then you just relay image that to a detector with, uh, that resolves in time and in, in space, and then you get basically slices of the band structure on the detector. You see it in real time. And so combining these two things now, you really do, like ground state measurements, you really do see the full 3D band structure in real time, right? Which is what it's got to be if you're going to do this pump probe experiment. So this is our setup sort of in its entirety. We now, you know, have the same beam line I showed you before. We're collect focusing at this momentum microscope. And this is sort of, you know, what it looks like in the lab or what sort of half of it looks like in the lab. And this, you know, most of this tube you see off here is the time of flight tube where after we do the imaging with the electrons to sort of fly and then they spread out based on their energy. So, yeah, I guess you wouldn't do that with photons, right? Photons all go the same speed pretty much unless you put them in something. But electrons have a lot of dispersion. And then, you know, we get basically now we do this as a function of pump probe delay and we're getting these full 3D blocks of data. This just shows you just sort of a movie of what that looks like. So this is looking at the band structure. Uh, this is looking at the conduction band electrons in bulk WS2. So you can see first we excite here to the corners of the brilliant zone, then we have a transfer here to the so-called sigma valley, and you're just watching this happen now. Okay. This is just another fun example which I thought would be cool. You're really sort of seeing, you know, I heard you guys have a course here called optical physics. You learn about matrix elements, selection rules, etc. You're really just sort of seeing that happen in action, right? So this is graphene. Graphene is, in a, in, in a certain sense, very simple, right? You can describe it by just linear combinations of p orbitals on the carbon atoms, and you can derive what the optical matrix element would look like in that model very nicely. And you see it has these nodes along the polarization direction. So if I put light polarized this way, I would expect to see nodes. Uh, and that way, and if I put light polarized this way, I'd expect to see nodes this way. Or you think about it is if you have electrons all the way around this direct cone, I'd excite them. I'd only see electrons in certain places around the cone up top. And then you do the experiment. This is just raw data. And you just see that. You just see beautifully the nodes nicely here. You can get a little more quantitative here. You can actually, you know, calculate with tight binding model what these uh, distributions should look like, taking into account of both the matrix cell from the pump and the matrix element for the photo emission. And then you can compare to the experiment. And it's just, it just, you know, you're just sort of seeing the selection rule in, in action, right? Um, and you, you can compare. It's actually, you know, it's quite nice. And now we're looking now, you excite these polarized electrons, essentially, in the conduction band. How then do they relax? How does electron, 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 phonon scattering eventually scramble that anisotropy you put in? Uh, so that's pretty nice. Okay, but I wanted to tell you, right, finally, I'm getting to the bulk of the talk. It's tungsten disulfide. Okay, so this is our tungsten disulfide experiment. So we're doing the monolayer tungsten disulfide. We're exciting here at the B exciton resonance. So an important point now compared to these optical measurements, in addition to seeing everything in momentum space, we're measuring in binding energy. Okay, because now you have this electron bound to the hole. And if I want to kick that electron out with this UV light, okay, it's going to have to overcome that binding energy with the hole. Okay, so an electron that's more tightly bound to the hole is going to come out at lower energy when I detect it. Right? So I'm basically measuring the electron hole binding energy in my, in my experiment. Um, this is our sample. This is another big win of doing this now with this photo emission electron microscope on the front end is the front end is an electron microscope. So I can image on the sample with micron resolution. And I can record signal from just a tiny sample, which in the 2D materials world is huge because now this opens up all these things you can make with exfoliation, scotch tape, you've heard of all this, etc. You know, you can do all that. You only get like 10 microns of stuff. Okay, now we can do the experiment on 10 microns of stuff. And that's also enabled by our, our signal noise to do this. And, um, you know, so the way you do that is you basically relay image, you make a real space image of the sample at an intermediate plane of the microscope, and then you just put an aperture to restrict electrons only coming from, a, say, a certain region of interest. 
So our spot size on the sample will be 20, 30 microns, but we're only taking electrons from just this tiny little flake. Okay? And so here you can see the difference, right? So this is bulk tungsten disulfide, and you can see, as expected for the bulk, the middle, uh, for the experts in the room, that the gamma point of the ground state brillion zone is higher than K. And then in the conduction band, you see parabolic dispersion, K squared dispersion for these free electrons in the conduction band. Now I do it in the bulk. Now I'm seeing the excitons down below the conduction band. Um, and then, okay, another uh, neat thing that you can do with uh, this that you'll never do with optical spectroscopy, right, is you can see dark states. Right? Another way to think about that is my final state is a continuum electron, which can, you know, have whatever angular momentum or whatever it wants, right? So there's basically no dark states in photo emission. You see everything. The selection rules to the to the continuum are very fluid, and so you have to conserve this momentum. But that's about it, right? So you can basically see all the dark states. So here, this is looking now at so-called dark excitons, where you have say the hole here at K and the electron at a different place in the brillion zone. And this you'd never be able to excite with light because you don't have the photon doesn't have the momentum to do it. But here, you can see it quite nicely. We do see this. There was another group that wrote a whole science paper, uh, one of the Death Stars wrote a whole science paper just about this. Uh, we do see it. We find in our experiment, it's, a, it's in, in tungsten disulfide, they did tungsten diselenide. We find it to be kind of a minor player. Uh, I could get into the details of that uh, more later, but you see it's actually a little bit higher energy, and that's, that's part of the reason that we don't see as much population there. So in this talk, I'm going to focus more on the coupling between the bright excitons at the edge of the brillion zone here, K. Okay. So now if I take just the corners here, all these Ks, and I add them up, I can look at the energy spectrum. And right away, you see something really interesting, because what we're exciting is supposed to be this nominal B exciton resonance, where I'm taking okay, an electron from this lower valence band and putting it up here, right, this more tightly bound valence band. That should have the same binding energy as the A exciton. But what I see in the spectrum, actually, is we see initially mostly, uh, most of the, you know, the highest intensity is here, actually, at these binding energies corresponding to excited A excitons. So this is pretty interesting. It tells you that this B exciton is actually very strongly mixed with the A exciton, such that not even that, you know, is, is necessarily a good initial state to think about. So... Uh, this has been, you know, seen in theory, actually, they've seen this, you could calculate this mixing between the A and B excitons in theory, uh, but uh, we actually see in the experiment a much stronger, uh, you know, weighting towards these excited A excitons than they previously predicted. So this is still something to sort out. We can try and, you can see this spectrum sort of has, you know, maybe two peaks or sort of overlapping features. At later delays, you see it sort of settled down into this lower uh, energy feature or, or higher binding energy feature. Um, okay, we can model this by basically sort of doing a two so-called global analysis, which is a standard thing in ultrafast spectroscopy, try and break this uh, signal into two components. And so basically we have a, a fitting that is, you know, two spectral components uh, times simple exponential d dynamics. And so this is what we get for the two components here. And you see this from this, we extract, you know, this green curve is our initial excited uh, distribution of binding energies, and it's peaked here at these excited A excitons. You know, you can get this from the fitting. I mean, you can also just look at the data and see it there, too. But uh, this is sort of nice. This confirms this. And, you know, then we see this green component basically decay into the, into the low energy component in about 400 femtoseconds, and then we see this guy live for a long time, the slowest energy. But this was a surprise. We didn't expect to see this high energy stuff here. Okay, so now let's think about doing this valley selective excitation. And with that, we can basically shine circularly polarized light on the sample. And then what we should do is excite just, say, K minus or K plus, depending on whether we use circularly polarized light, you know, different helicities, sigma plus or sigma minus. Now, one subtlety is that we don't come in exactly at zero degrees. So then you have to break this polarization into, you know, what it would be in the plane of the sample. And so at our, you know, 45 degrees, it still ends up working out that it's sort of a 25 to 1 
intensity ratio. You do have a little bit of the wrong polarization. You've also got an out-of-plane component. It turns out the out-of-plane component doesn't really do anything. I can talk about that later if you're interested. Um, but here's what you see. So what you see is we do see a difference between the valleys, but it's extremely short-lived. So this is exciting with sigma plus light. We see the K plus valley light up a little bit faster, and then the K minus valley basically follow right behind. And then if we reverse the helicity, it reverses just like we'd expect. Um, and we see there's only you know, sort of 50 femtoseconds difference between these two things. So that's kind of interesting. It's very fast. Um, we can also quantify that by looking at the helicity, uh, basically the difference between the K plus signal minus the K minus signal divided by the sum. And, you know, the biggest this number could be is 1, and it gets to about 0.6, which given the 50 femtoseconds and our instrument response and the fact we're 45 degrees is pretty good. That's about what we'd expect. Okay? So now you see this basically electron anyway that we measure is sort of delocalizing over the whole brilliant zone or all the K valleys very quickly. So then the next question is, uh, you know, what is the distribution? Can I go look deeper now? Can I say, okay, what did I excite here? And, you know, did they all, all those different binding energies that I saw, did they all go over the same? So well, I should mention, too, that, we, you know, we don't think this is phonons because we've done this measurement at two different temperatures. You know, we've done it at 120 Kelvin, and we get basically the same result. This, uh, uh, you know, time scale you see on this is basically just our instrument response, which is 200 femtoseconds. We see the same thing if we do the experiment in cold tungsten disulfide. So we really do, you know, this is an indication that it's likely this intervalley coulomb exchange. So now let's look at the energy distributions. This looks at, you know, we, this is exciting. It's sigma minus. So first we populate K minus. Then we can ask how does this transfer over to the other valley. Um, and what you see is that they basically look the same. Except if you look, you'll see this 50 femtosecond shift. So if you do this whole GA fitting I did with the two components before independently on the two valleys, you get exactly the same thing except a 50 femtosecond shift. And you can look at what that initially populated distribution comes out of the, out of the fitting, looks like, and this is basically identical. Right? Maybe this thing is here, but I don't know if I believe that or not, but they're basically the same. So this is sort of elastic, right? Whatever it's doing, it's sort of conferred, conserving energy as it goes from one, one valley to the other. Another thing you could look at is you could look at the momentum. So what we see overall is that we get initially kind of a broad momentum distribution, which eventually settles down. Um, now let's look at what it is when I excite, let's say now this, in this data set, we excited K plus for sigma plus light. And then, uh, you know, now it goes over to K minus. You can see what, okay, we didn't try and make too much out of this except sort of fitting this with the Gaussian and saying something about the width. And this is the width. And as you can see, is that basically this distribution of momentum is just sort of teleported over to the other valley. So this is also, yeah. Your 50 second uh, is that the distance between valleys? That's the time uh, shift between. Uh, does that also equate to the distance between the valleys? Uh, well, the distance, you mean the, the valleys are in momentum. So shifted on these two variables, right? Yeah. So these two, this signal is basically the same as this. It just starts 50 femtoseconds later. Is that what you meant? Yeah, I'm just wondering. Oh, well, they're, they're, this is a momentum space, so it's not a physical okay. distance. It's moving. The electron and hole don't actually have to move. They just have to change. They, they don't even, a Q can stay the same. Their center of mass can stay the same. It's just the constituents when I make this wave function out of different electron hole pairs, right? That's what's changing. Yeah, they, we could, that's true. You, you could have that. That's true. But then, you know, you would see, you would think if you were doing that also, that this would get shifted down by an optical phonon or so, which is 50 or milli ED in these materials, which I think we would see. Yeah. yeah. The extension actually is about a few milli electrons for all of here, and that sets the time scale, so that would be picosecond time scale. So that's, that's uh, it's, it could be tens of milli EV if you're at high Q. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So tens of milli EV gets you in the 50, 100 okay. femtosecond world. Okay. Yeah. If that's what you're after, yeah. This is cool. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so, so then we can look, you know, so we, look, we basically see this momentum distribution teleported and then everything 
I don't want to say cools down, but maybe, it, I mean, there's definitely still some phone on, so okay, right? Uh, but we don't think that's the dominant thing, because if you, you know, you change the temperature by 200 Kelvin, you're going to make a huge difference in the phonon population, the optical phonons. You're saying it's Columbic electron? It's just, we think it's, well, all right, let me get to my, so it, this is my, you know, it looks like a duck, it quacks like a duck, maybe it's a duck slide, okay? It basically, I told you before, you know, we couple the bright states, right? And if it's just mixing of the wave function, you don't need phonons, right? This should not depend strongly on the temperature, okay? And it looks like it pretty much conserves energy. And, okay, caveat, we don't actually measure Q. We measure the electron momentum. But it's kind of hard to imagine something that, you know, mixes up Q but keeps the electron momentum distribution the same. So, you know, it looks like it conserves that too. Okay, so that's, that's our working hypothesis. But then there's a number of questions about this because also I told you that this intervalley Coulomb exchange should scale as the electron hole overlap wave function squared times the momentum. And so now let's just, you know, forget this fitting stuff. Let's just look at, I'll just take lanes here and just integrate in these little boxes, the green one and the yellow one, and just look at the signal. And we see, you know, do these tighter binding energy ones, which should have a small, more electron hole overlap, do they go faster? And what we see is no. If anything, they might even go a little slower. So this is a little bit puzzling, right? We would think that because of this electron hole uh, overlap factor that maybe these tighter binding energy guys would go faster. But we, we don't see that, at least within our resolution. Um, and then in terms of the momentum, you know, we might also expect that if, okay, you know, to, uh, excitons in general with a higher electron momentum would have more chance of having a higher total Q, total exciton momentum, you might expect that you get like a donut over here, right? Because the ones on the outside go first because they have the higher momentum. But we don't see that either. We basically, within our resolution, just see everything go over. So I wouldn't say, you know, I'm still sticking with my duck slide here. I think we, it sort of looks and quacks like a duck. But maybe we're all still, even with this, you know, sort of tour de force experiment, maybe we don't see the whole duck, right? Maybe we're just seeing the beak or something. So it would be nice, for example, in future measurements to also measure the whole. So in, in summary, you know, basically this high-performance ARPES, uh, I think it's really a paradigm-shifting thing in this whole business of measuring, doing ultra-fast spectroscopy and condensed matter in general. Because now you're really measuring in the basis that you think about the problem. Uh, and you don't miss anything. There's no dark states. And this is just showing you know, 3D prediction of this tungsten disulfide, right? And we get this stuff, you know, every pump probe delay. The data rate from this thing is like Netflix streaming video. We're taking the, the hits are coming in at 10 megabytes per second, right? So we generate 100 gigabytes of data of this sort of 4D data in a day. Um, Another, you know, in terms of science, an exciting result that we see is that the B exciton doesn't look like the B exciton. It looks like excited A excitons, so that's very interesting. And we see this very fast um, uh, delocalization of the electron, which is consistent with these fast, you know, these ultra-fast optical spectroscopy experiments see, but now we really see the electron move, and we can measure both the en energy and momentum dependence of that. And so far, we don't see a strong uh, dependence on on energy momentum, which is consistent with this intervalley exchange mechanism in one way, but in other ways opens up new questions. So with that, I just thank you uh, for your attention. I'm sorry if I went over a little bit. I don't think I went over that bad. Um, but um, I also just want to acknowledge that this is really a team effort, and we've been very fortunate to have uh, collaborators at Ohio State uh, really making the samples for us and also uh, help from Shudu at Stony Brook making samples. And then we collaborate with uh, Gerd Schernhenze, who's the inventor of the, of the momentum microscope. And uh, there's also really, these are, you know, these are really the Jedi, okay? These the students here that make these experiments work. And uh, we also thank the funding agencies, uh, especially DOE who stuck with us, and Air Force who stuck with us on this project for many years of development to, to get to this point. And uh, you can read about this work on the archive here. And thank you very much.
Thanks, Tom. Really good talk. I'll open it up to questions. Rolf? work, I have to say. Um, Thank you. It looks uh, like science fiction almost. Uh, it really did. <laughs> I, I have a question about the uh, center of mass momentum of the exciton. So I didn't quite understand what in your apparatus determines it and how much control do we have over it and how big does it get in the end? So we don't measure the center of mass momentum. We measure the photoelectron momentum, um, which it may also be related to the whole momentum because when you kick the electron out, you leave the hole with that momentum in, in the crystal, right? So we're measuring half of it. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't, you know, I would never look at that and say, oh, that's an exciton with that Q. What I would say is I would say the width of the electron momentum seems a reasonable thing to me that it would correlate with the width of whatever, the width of the distribution of electron momentum I see would correlate at least with the width of Q, of the width of distribution in, in center of mass momentum, such that you know, as my as my ele photoelectron momentum distribution is shrinking, also my center of mass momentum distribution is shrinking. Now that might be wrong. It could be these are all excitons with Q equals zero, right? And you just have them spread out. And from optical excitation, from a certain perspective, that's what you would expect, I, I, I guess, right? Because you shouldn't be able to excite high momentum. Ex Q, high Q with, with a photon. Does it actually look like a one has wave function if you brought a, square, uh, a slice of it? Uh, I mean, we know that one exciton is one over one plus K squared or something like that squared. Or... I have not done it. I, I, you mean like fit it, you know, like plot it at the amplitude, and then we should do it. We haven't done it. So far, we've just fit it and look at this width. Uh, actually, when I was at March meeting, uh, Felipe Jornada showed some stuff where he expects was actually calculating this AB mixing when you excite B and show the A part of it was like a triangle. And in some of the data, maybe we see this triangle. I'm trying to get postdoc to, you know, combine things a little more carefully. But may maybe. You don't see it here because this is all the valley summed without, without uh, properly rotating them. So she just takes them all and sums them and then you get the width. Okay, uh, but but if you look at a single valley, of course, single noise is much worse. Maybe we see some structure in those a n greater than one guys. Do you have a question? Well, I guess to tag on to that, what's the next resource researched funded effort and expectations of results in your same triangle? Oh, uh, well, that would be that would be really exciting. I mean, I think a lot of these type of measurements, where you're looking at fine features of the momentum distribution, would get better if we were making more temp measurements at low temperature. We have made some measurements at low temperature. Uh, we have, but our manipulator right now sort of sucks, and they're sort of heroic. So we have a new manipulator. We need to do the engineering to install it, and then we'll have a much more stable setup at low temperature. And then I think looking at these fine momentum features will get better. Uh, we could also, in principle, run our microscope differently to zoom in on, like, you know, a particular valley, right, and get better resolution that way and see some of these fine, fine features that way. In terms of what we're actually funded to do, I actually don't even have any funding to do this. Um, uh, I, I'm actually funded to do this on molecules, so we're actually uh, also going to go after looking at um, exciton dynamics in molecular crystals, so tetracine, pentacene, uh, and so-called singlet fission dynamics. Uh, but we're continuing also, we're also getting geared up to do heterostructures. So looking at, um, and that's really nice, and you can see also the dark states in the heterostructure. Um, Arvinder? In these momentum images, you see some structure. Is that significant? In this one, I would say no, because we're, we're not being that careful how we add the valleys. We're really only just sort of reducing this down to a width. I should add a picture of this thing and maybe it starts to look like Jornada's triangle, but I'd have to go on my email and dig it up. Maybe, but I'm, you know, we were confident to, 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 to say something about the width, you know, sort of the, the second moment, if you will, of the distribution, but beyond that, yeah, there might be, there might be, but we got to treat the data a little more carefully. For ultrafast spectroscopy, you spoke about the ultraviolet region. Uh, how, did, how does the performance, how is the performance in the visible of the IR region? 
oh, you can't do this in the performance in the, in the visible IR because you just you basically don't have enough momentum in, of the electron. You can't give an electron enough momentum to get it out of the. You, you can only you can basically if if you do it in the visible or the IR, you can only look here, right? And so there are people that do that. They do these you know multi photon photo emission experiment, and it works great if all your dynamics are here in the middle of the brilliant zone. So it works great for, you know, topological insulators and stuff like this where everything's in gamma. Okay, but as soon as you want to look at these 2D materials where everything's out at K, you know, 1.5 inverse angstrom, you've got to have 20 EV. And another thing I should point out from an optics perspective, two, I, I don't know if I have the data here on these slides, but tunable XUV, we went to the trouble to build a monochromator where we could select the different harmonics. And if you want to say anything quantitative about the intensities of things that, like, say, K versus sigma, different parts of the brilliant zone, where they have a different photo emission matrix element, which depends on the photon energy, you have to tune the photon energy. These results here, where we have this K sigma ratio looking at the dark state, you can make that ratio, I don't want to say whatever you want, but it varies widely depending on what probe photon energy you're doing. So most people building these systems are just setting up. It's easier if you just do it one probe photon energy, but then it's very hard to be quantitative. So that's a caveat. So you really need to tune the photon energy. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. What kind of pulse do you use to excite it? Is it resonant when you do the sigma selective? Yeah, there were, were resonant. We're 2.4 EV, which were resonant nominally with the B, what most well, what people call the B exciton. It's this peak that, you know, looks like the B exciton based on where it is in energy. I mean, I'm not saying it's not the B exciton. I'm just saying in ARPES it doesn't look like a B exciton. This was room temperature? This is room temperature, yeah. Then we've done, we have some spectra at low temperature. Things behave as expected. Everything shifts up by 100 milliEV because the band gap shifts up by 100 milliEV, right? Because there's less, you don't know, have the phonon renormalization of the band gap. Most things look the same. We, like I said, there was you know we don't have as much data there. Statistics aren't as good, so I don't did show a lot of that, but I can show you. Are, are all these materials you're looking at uh, fundamentally linear excitons? These are bonding excitons. These are bonding excitons. Absolutely. That's why they're well localized. Yeah. If you look at you know actually when you go to your molecular stuff, it's the same thing. No, no, the molecular stuff's very much more like Frankel excitons. So you can look at the Frank you know in, in momentum space. Okay, this is ground state for pentacene. Yeah, I had it here, right? Yeah, it's blob. It's much more delocalized. So, and, and if you do calculations, you know what the band. And actually, people have done our ground state are based on these things, and you know the bandwidth is sort of 100 milli, right, as opposed to EV for these things. So these these molecular things are much more localized. But yeah, and the 2D material is all funny. These are sort of is this going to, are you going to see the same kind of um, rich dynamics when you go to a Frankel exit? Uh, well, I think it'll be different, right? You're not, you're not as localized in momentum space somewhere. More the question with the molecule, these particular molecule things we want to look at is, you know, as it goes from a singlet Frankel exciton to two triplet Frankel exitons, what's in between? What does the wave function of this thing look like in between in this so-called uh, single fission? And how localized and delocalized are those states? They, they certainly differ a little bit from the 1E excitons in the sense that the Rydberg series is not the ideal Rydberg series. And the Bohr radius is only in 2 nanometers or so. They're yeah. close almost to the scale of the, of, of the lattice constant. Okay, but I definitely wouldn't call it a Frankel exciton. No, it's not a Frankel exciton. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a small <laughs> Vanier exciton. Yeah. It's small. With a lot of strong coupling. So you don't get the nice, you know, it's not the nice uh, like one S yeah, yeah, yeah. No, nothing's like, Gall I mean, gallium arsenide is, you know, it's a beautiful thing. Right? Yeah. All right, well, Tom will be around through tomorrow. Any questions you want to follow up with him? But uh, let's thank him one more time for his talk.